What are residents doing to limit water usage during the drought? PV High Boys Baseball have turned their season around and you'll hear from their head coach. And it's the biggest party on the hill. Are you ready for this annual event? Peninsula residents are voicing major concerns over mandatory statewide water restrictions. Residents packed an informational meeting held at Cal Water's office in Torrance. Cal Water representative gave an overview of the reductions being imposed on its Peninsula customers. Every customer will receive a water budget based on their summer water consumption in 2013 and 2014. Any customer can appeal their budget along with the drought-related surcharges that may be imposed. Our approach in responding to the drought, and this came directly from our board of directors and Cal Water's president and CEO, is we want to have a customer-first approach. We don't want to be out there finding people. We don't want to be penalizing people. I think at the end of the drought, if we haven't had to penalize a single one of our customers, we're going to be elated about that. Because it means that we were able to educate our customers through meetings like this. We we're able to work with each and every one of them to make sure that they have the tools and information necessary to comply with restricted use of, prohibited uses of water. We've got a 36% reduction that our customers in Palos Verdes on the peninsula are going to have to achieve in 20, 2015 versus 2013. It makes sense to look at what was achieved in 2014. Unfortunately, we only had a very small reduction in water use in 2014 versus 2013. That's the thick blue uh, bar on the bottom. It was a 4% reduction. So to get to where we need to get to by the end of 2015, it's an additional 32% reduction that we're going to have to get this year uh, for the rest of the year through February 2016 uh, to get to where the governor has told us that we need to be at. Uh, 2013 and the beginning of 2014 for us, we were in a remodel. Okay. So our water usage was almost nil. What do I do before June 4th through 1st to appeal that? Right, so that, that's the exact type of thing that is going to be, you're going to be able to go through the appeal process to look at what the water use was in 2013 versus 2014. Uh, and we'll be able to work on that with you based on the number of people that are in the household, et cetera. You want to be able to take in all those unique circumstances into account. I would like to know if you touched on it a little bit, the fact that we are going to be conserving it for some of us a significant change. Yes. How do you deal with revenue versus rates? I don't want to get another bill, another letter a year from now saying, well, the rates have been, you know, we've, everybody's conserved, revenue has dropped, we all know nothing is free. Yeah. You're talking about free toilets, free nozzles, free sprinkler heads, free services for people to come do um, the conservation surveys. Right. So how are we looking at the revenue stream and how that's going to be supported without rate raises? So uh, one, one of the other, uh, the first question I think related to the water revenue adjustment mechanism. And so that's what our plan doing. is to apply any of those surcharges that our customers do incur for going over their water budget to account for that loss of revenue. In terms of the penalties that you're, that you're talking about or that we were just talking about, the $1,500 penalty, our hope is, again, that we don't have to impose those on anybody. If we do, that revenue is going to be used to offset the cost that, of our programs and the efforts that we're making okay. to, uh, to comply with the governor's executive okay. order and the State Water Resource Control Board. Now, that being said, I'm, I, I can't make a pledge and say that rates are never going to go up. Cal Water is offering a wide variety of conservation rebates, programs, and tools to help customers reduce their water use, especially during the state's historic drought. Customers can log on to calwater.org or call 310-257-1400 with any questions. And you can watch the Cal Water meeting in its entirety every day on RPV TV at 8 p.m. The Peninsula Education Foundation held its biggest fundraiser of the year. The annual main event took place at the Terranea Resort. Liz Brown Swanson joins us from the celebration that benefits the Peninsula's public schools. Liz. <music> Thanks, Maria. This year's main event was definitely rocking at Terranea. The theme, rock of all ages, and all ages definitely came here to help raise money to support the Peninsula's public schools. I love that the entire community gathers together to support our public schools. It's wonderful. We're expecting over 500 guests this evening. We have community members, we have school board members, teachers, 
administrators, parents, all here to support our public schools. You know, the Ed Foundation has done so many great things. You know, at the middle school level, they support the STEM program, they support our counselors, um, they uh, drop our, you know, our student to teacher ratio, and uh, without the Ed Foundation, our schools would be good, but I don't know if they'd really be exceptional. I've been in the school district for about 11 years. Um, I've also been in different school districts, and I feel like Palos Verdes School District really offers our students the best education possible. So phenomenal to see all these parents, all grandparents, teachers, staff, here to celebrate the Peninsula Ed Foundation and to contribute to the education of our children. Absolutely nothing better than that. Absolutely. I'm here, of course, for the greatest teacher on earth, right? I've learned that a long time ago, and this is really why I'm here. So for the, here, the kids, PE Foundation, great great time to be here. Well, the Ed Foundation really helps me because it helps spawn, it help, the donations help go towards uh, a really important department at our school, which is the College Career Center, which houses Mrs. Koyanagi and Mrs. Terry Llewellyn, both very important women in my life who have... Um, helps me by like getting me ready for the college like the college process and the admission process. The PEF Foundation what they do is they like supply our school with money for like teachers, librarians and all that stuff. So obviously without those kind of funds, we wouldn't have these programs at our school and they're really beneficial for people who need to learn. To put it in context, between what Ed Foundation brings in and our parcel tax and and and, and volunteer contributions, that's about 11% of our budget. So to put that in perspective, without the money that comes in through these sources, we could not maintain the programs that we put forward right now. It would be impossible. This is our biggest fundraiser and we'll raise uh, probably around $300,000 or more tonight. I mean, when I, when my youngest started school in 2005, uh, we were, I think the Ed Foundation was raising a million dollars. So in that time frame, I mean, we've more than tripled and uh, it's really amazing. This is actually year six that we've had the main event here. So yes, of course, very excited to have so many people from the local community here tonight. It's one of our chosen charities and of course many of us have children in the system, me included. And so it's a really fun cause to support and a great event to be at. Everybody here at the main event definitely felt like a rock star. Congratulations to the Peninsula Education Foundation. Rock on, and if you want to get involved, you can check out the website at pvpef.org. All right, I have one song to end with, and that is Good Vibrations Here. Back to you, Maria, in the studio. It's been a year since the Palos Verdes Historical Society reorganized. To mark the milestone, the Society held a community celebration at the historic Vanderlip property. Liz Brown Swanson was at the event and has more on the group's goal to open a museum and preserve the peninsula's heritage. Hi Maria, well you could say history's in the making once again here at the Vanderlip property where the Palos Verdes Historical Society invited the community to come together for the Society's one year anniversary celebration. Well, today what I wanted to do was grab the histor uh, Historical Society and have a party. We've never done that here. And I said this was about time to do it. So I cleaned out the duck pond area here, cleaned out the irrigation system, and invited everybody to come. And that's what you're seeing right now. This was Frank, Frank Venner's favorite place. Back in 1975, uh, I, along with some others, incorporated the first Historical Society. Uh, about 1985, it moved from one goal to a museum that was held at the Malaga Cove School Tower and Mary Rodman and her husband Nick were responsible for that. They did a fantastic job. Unfortunately, they were summarily evicted by the school board and as a result, they put everything in storage and thank goodness for that. They took good care of it, put it in storage, none of it was lost and once the name could be reused and reincorporated again, I was in touch with the Secretary of State and as soon as they said you can go, then a number of us got together and Hugh, Dwight, uh, Abbott and a number of others. Uh, we reincorporated on April 14th of last year. We had uh, a number of goals to achieve and we've achieved all of them. So we're really getting to go forward now. We've got all the artifacts. We've got them in a place that we can curate them and we are fortunate to have Joe Koch curate them for us. So things are going fantastic. What we need now is membership and money. And a museum. 
Well, that's what the money is for. This is just a, a sampling of what we have. We have thousands of items, artifacts. Um, example over here is a Indian grinding stone. This is found in Palos Verdes, the modern pestle. And this is really interesting over here too. This is a piece of fossil whale baleen. It's probably about um, 14 million years old. And Palos Verdes is one of the few places in the world where you can find um, fossil whale baleen. And over here we have some spurs uh, from the Rancho period here at Pans Palos Verdes. And then over here is an interesting thing. This is a, um, I can get it for you. This is a mammoth tooth. This was found at Chandler's uh, Sand and Gravel Quarry. And that's a Colombian mammoth. And uh, of course they extinct now, but they uh, roamed all the hills just like uh, everything they find at the La Brea Tar Pits they have found here in Palos Verdes. There's some history in Rancho Palos Verdes and it is worthwhile keeping it. Uh, we got here pretty late. I mean, my family came in here in, in uh, 1913. But before that, there were a lot of cattle up here, there were a lot of sheep, there were a lot of farmers, and about 400 years of land use management. And uh, there's probably a lot we can learn by looking backwards with what we have to take care of now. We are getting involved to continue what was started a long time ago and it was closed down for a long time and we were selling the old oldest house on the hill, the Vanderloop Cottage, and through that process and people coming through, historically minded, a lot of things were regenerated, then we had the 100 year celebration and the fever seems to be back, so we're here to support. Of course, now the big challenge is finding a place to put all these wonderful artifacts and looking for museum. You guys are in real estate, do you think that'll happen sooner than later? Well, there are a couple of locations they're, they're aiming at. I think the one that makes most sense is at the Interpretive Center to possibly create, um, get some grants from some uh, uh, charitable organizations that might expand that. Well, there has to be a local museum in here somewhere because the collection is wonderful. I think it's got to be vibrant and it's got to be exciting, um, you know, to teach people of all ages. So if you're interested in finding out more about the PV Historical Society and just getting involved, becoming a member, you can go on to the website at palaceverdeshistoricalsociety.org. Back to you, Maria, in the studio. And you can check out a few of the historical artifacts which are on display at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. And when we come back, are you ready for the biggest party here on the Hill? And how did the PV Boys baseball team turn their season around you're going to find out when we come back. For his sake. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide and go seek. The Palos Verdes Library District and Peninsula Friends of the Library unveiled and dedicated a new privately commissioned sculpture called The Storyteller. The sculpture is a gift from Marilyn and John Long of Palos Verdes and the Long Family Foundation. Here's more with Mark J. Dottie. <laughs> Here we are at the Malaga Cove Library, where we are about to pull the rabbit out of the hat. The library has a long history of, of being involved with art and public art, but no, we weren't specifically um, looking for a, sculpt a sculpture. What happened was that Marilyn Long contacted us, and uh, she said that the foundation was interested in doing something at the library, down here at the Malaga Cove Library, and were we interested in perhaps exploring a sculpture. And we were really excited about it because I think it's just a really nice addition to the library and the gallery space. So it kind of went from there, but it was really at the initiative of the Long Family Foundation. When we first moved here, we wanted to be involved in the community. And I started off taking my kids to the Palos Verdes Art Center. And they took a lot of art classes. And I'm really interested in art and uh, cultural activities. and. PTA and got immersed in the community that way. That's great. And now you have con you have contributed uh, a, a statue to Malaga Cove Library. That would be a permanent installation out here. Is that right? Well, the library is. Would you believe this year it's 85 years old, and um, it's a 
uh, it was the first library that was conceived on this peninsula in Palos Verdes Estates. And um, I wanted something fun, something um, whimsical, and the name of the piece is The Storyteller, and the artist is Michael Azell. In 2008, uh, our Long Family Foundation uh, worked with the library and we presented a sculpture to the library and it was by Brad Howe, who's a renowned Los Angeles artist and uh, we had a little contest for the kids and they could name the sculpture and a seventh grader named it Balancing Knowledge and it's a, it's a contemporary piece but it's right in front of the Peninsula Center Library and um, seven years later we decided I think Malika Cove needs a sculpture, so worked with the library and the board and Kathy Gould, and uh, subsequently we have a new sculpture here at the Malika Cove Library. So is it uh, your calling card to uh, put sculptures together for our community? <laughs> well, that's one of the things that Marilyn really likes to do, and uh, she's also on the board of directors at the PV Art Center. And so we do like to, uh, uh, put public pieces on so that the community can see it and uh, Marilyn also and I uh, commissioned a uh, sculpture at the Botanical Garden at the South Coast Botanical Garden as well. How did they find you? What started all this? Well the conversation on the cell phone was she introduced herself and she said she was interested in uh, one of my sculptures and especially the fact that it had the books involved in it because uh, she was doing a project with a library and I kind of steered her towards the storyteller which was a brand new piece for me at that time and uh, the storyteller actually had three books underneath them but we did it a little bit different for the sculpture here at uh, Malaga Cove. Well, as Marilyn Long said, sculptures are free to touch, and you can do just that right here at the Malaga Cove Library with The Storyteller. It was time to raise money and have some fun for a great local charity. Ride to Fly is a therapeutic horseback riding program which supports individuals who are physically and mentally challenged. They recently had their annual event, and Rocco Fonzarelli was there for all the fun. Hi Maria, I'm here with Annie and Simon. Annie, what do you think of the Ride to Fly Carnival fundraiser? I think it's awesome because because with their abilities sometimes it's kind of hard. <laughs> sometimes it's kind of hard for them to ride horses. And I think with people volunteering to raise money so they can, I think that's awesome. I just want to take this opportunity to welcome you to our 10th annual Country Carnival fundraiser. Uh, we enjoy working on this. We've been working on it for six months and we hope that you also have a great time today. We have our country store, we have a petting zoo, we have pony rides, face painter, we have the balloon lady, we have all kinds of games and we want you just to enjoy your day today. We don't really get too many direct donations and so this event is really great for every year when we just participate and get the kids riding. It gives us new gear, it gives us some new horses some years, and it spreads the word about Ride to Fly. It's really great. I started out as a student because uh, I have multiple sclerosis. So in order to rehab myself, I started riding. And lo and behold, I ended up as an instructor about seven years later after I started riding. I have trouble walking, but I have no trouble on a horse because of the balance, the core strength, and, and leg strength. So um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful therapy for adults, children with all kinds of handicaps. Daniel's been riding for about five weeks. And at first when he came, he was a little nervous to get on a big horse. Yeah. But I think all those nerves have kind of gone away, and he's really having a good time.
great place to come and see the kids and see the community and get a little taste of the horses and the beautiful, wonderful thing that Ride to Fly does in helping kids who can't necessarily ride on their own to get access to horses and the therapy they give all of us. I think it's really good and everyone should get an opportunity to ride a horse. And now it's time to catch up with John Clayton, who's taking us to every park right here in RPV. Today he joins us from Clovercliff Park. Okay, so we're doing this series on the parks in RPV. And then Natty Silva says to me, John, let's go to Clovercliff Park. Now, we're sitting in Clovercliff Park. This, is this a park? This is a park. We call this a pocket park. A pocket, <laughs> a pocket park, okay. Yes, it's a very small park. It's about 7,700 square feet, so not too big. And uh, this piece of property, the acreage was donated by two families to the city in 1978. In this series is to show RPV's parks. Um, I guess you tell me. Uh, this area was never slated for any big improvements. Really, there's a trail through here and there's some rocks for seating, but there won't be any picnic tables or barbecues or anything set in here. So it's really just more a, a nice area for walking through, maybe with your dog or with your friends, and just kind of contemplating you know the moment so very peaceful it's also a great place you know for photography having you know little gatherings on the on the stones here I mean you could shoot some great pictures here yeah you could and uh, it's kind of a well-kept secret because I think really just people in the area know about it it's pretty small and pretty secluded the address for Clovercliff Park is 28801 Golden Meadow Drive come on down and discover it yourself and in sports, it's been a successful season thus far for the PV High boys baseball team. But just like some of our pro teams, they had some struggles to overcome in the first few games. I caught up with the head coach who gives us more insight on how they overcame a rough start. Well, you know, the season's kind of had its typical ups and downs. You know, we, we've had to overcome our fair share of adversity we've had some some key injuries in a couple different spots and uh had a lot of tight ball games so uh you know a lot of which we've won so we, we've uh we've been lucky and fortunate to uh to come out on top in a lot of one run games um but uh you know the guys have been pretty consistently in every ball game seems like a lot of players have played baseball for a very long time and they've chose that as the sport do you find that a lot of the guys um or some of the guys here also play other sports as well they do. They do. Um, you know, our, our, our first baseman, D.H. Tanner Tellenbach, has been part of two CIF championship football teams. Uh, Adam Fogel, who's one of our outfielders, um, played basketball on, on varsity and, and played significant minutes on, on the basketball team this year. Connor Buckle, who's an infielder, uh, played football uh, the last couple of years. Uh, Tyler Rosen has played football in the past. Uh, Mitchell Templin. So we, got, we have quite a few guys that have... Uh, have either played sport, uh, other sports in high school or continue to play other sports in high school. What do you think that they have learned most from doing that, what they bring over to the baseball field? You know, uh, like in, in Tanner's case, I think it's just having a championship attitude. Uh, but also, you know, they, they they learn different athletic skill sets that, that definitely transition and, and help them in this game. Uh, so, so and and just it, 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 it it's a fresh take. You know, they're not they're not sitting there, uh, you know, working on baseball for eleven months. They're working right. on other things, and and it's that's always good as well. For a coach and a coaching standpoint, what's the biggest challenge that you face every season as a baseball coach? You know, I think it's just trying to figure things out of how people fit together and work together and, and, and what roles guys uh, fill and, and, and you know, they don't necessarily have to like what they're doing, but they have to accept and, and understand how important those roles are, you know, certainly if you're not a starter. Uh, and, and we tend to use a lot of guys uh, off the bench, you know, we do things a little differently. Um, you know, we're going to play the matchup, we're going to play the situation, we're going to utilize a lot of guys off the bench. And uh, it's important for those those guys to, to understand their roles and, and you know, try to perform to the best of their ability. 
For nearly 50 years, the women of Las Condolistas have cooked up one of the peninsula's tastiest fundraisers. Liz Brown Swanson joins us from the group's annual spring event held at the spectacular Catalina View Gardens. <music> Maria, I'm here at the Catalina View Gardens where the members of Los Condolistas are putting on their 47th annual spring event. And yes, this fundraiser has a lot of fun happening. You can see the community has come together to enjoy great food, wine, shopping in a fabulous marketplace, and enjoying some guest speakers, including a famous chef. And everyone's here, of course, to raise money for children's charities and the environment. We're really proud. In 47 years, we've raised almost two and a half million dollars for children and environmental charities. This year, our theme is garden to table, fresh, entertain, or uh, cooking and entertaining, and we've called it Wild Side to the Table. Uh, for the first 40. Four years, our event was called a walk on the wild side. So this year, we're trying to put the wild side back into the name by calling it Wild Side to the Table. This is fabulous. It shows off PV to the best, doesn't it? The beautiful ocean in the background is just couldn't be better. And these ladies have figured out everything. The idea of having these beautiful boxes delivered and everyone fed in one hour with beautiful food, happy day. I love that they're that they're really honing in on this this trend that really is capturing the whole industry and really the whole country about kind of farm to table eating because what it means is just being closer to where your food comes from. What are you going to talk about and share about cooking? Well, I'm here to share my experience on Chopped. So I'm a Chopped champion. I was on this show in 2014 and I thought it'd be fun to both show them what it was like and also tell them a little bit about why I think I won and what kind of helped me keep my cool under pressure. We are thrilled to have them back. This is the second year in a row they've been back to our new venue. You know, when we acquired the property in 1994, the Walk on the Wild Side was held here. And then, unfortunately, they had to move off to other locations. But we're thrilled to have them back. We now have a five-acre vineyard with 5,600 grapevines. To give you an idea, we have right here just four grapevines. You can see the grapes on this vine right here. These are table grapes. We're going to have the vines down below will look like this in two more years. So it's a big undertaking. But this year, we'll finally have a harvest. We'll have the 2015 Catalina View Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Just describe today the scene setter here. you got a full basket already, and it just opened up a half hour ago. You've got lots of goodies you've already bought. Well, <laughs> first of all, Jim York's site is amazing, easy to get to, good parking. So kitchen things, I'm here with three friends that have, I've all sold houses to over the years, and now we're good friends. Um, jewelry, some kitchenware, uh, maybe a purse. And so just having a good time, and it just makes it so easy and fun to support the group. Such a lovely day, a lovely venue, uh, so many nice people that come out, so it makes all of the hard work throughout the year worth it. All right, Maria, well, once again, the members of Las Condolistas had all the right ingredients for a successful fundraising event. And on a sweet note, I am going to bring you back a loaf of their very famous, very lemon bread. Back to you, Maria, in the studio. <laughs> And finally, it's that time of year again to get your fill of fun and, well, funnel cake. It's the 28th annual Palos Verdes Street Fair and Music Festival, which will take place Saturday, June 6th and Sunday, June the 7th. And for all of our younger residents, Teen Night is back on Friday, June the 5th. Parking and admission to the fair is free. And for more information, you can go to their website at pvstreetfair.com. And RPV TV will be there too. We hope to see you. That will do it for us. From everyone here at RPV TV, make it a great day.